The Three Caskets Believed to have been compiled in England at the end of the 13th century, the Gesta Romanorum, Deeds of the Romans was its title for no obvious reason, is an extraordinary jumble. It was the basis for another Latin book with the same title, published in continental Europe soon after. Designed for the use of priests wishing to ram home morals by means of tales, some of its teachings are extremely thin. The jester adopted stories from any source, from the Bible, the Quran, the Talmud, the Buddhist scriptures, Hinduism and previous devout writings. Few among the audiences who were regaled with this material for 400 years as they sat in church, however, could have suspected that many of the apologues being advanced to bolster their faith originated from several despised infidel civilizations. Schiller, Shakespeare, William Morris, Parnell, and a host of other writers whose work is still well known are indebted to the collection. Shakespeare found in it the plot of his Pericles, Chaucer raided it for his History of Constance, Walpole for the Mysterious Mother, and Boccaccio for his two friends, and innumerable others have followed their example. Although the manner in which its lessons are put generally seems dispiritingly pedestrian to the modern reader, this English translation of the original of Shakespeare's Three Caskets sequence in The Merchant of Venice gives a fair impression of the jester at its best. At one time there dwelt in Rome a mighty emperor named Anselm, who had married the king's daughter of Jerusalem, a fair lady and gracious in the sight of every man. But she was long with the emperor ere she bare him any child, wherefore the nobles of the empire were very sorrowful, because their lord had no heir of his own body begotten. At last it befell that this Anselm walked after supper one evening into his garden, and bethought himself that he had no heir, and how the king of Amploy warred on him continually, for so much as he had no son to make defence in his absence. Therefore he was sorrowful, and went to his chamber and slept. Then he thought he saw a vision in his sleep, that the morning was more clear than it was wont to be, and that the moon was much paler on the one side than on the other. And after he saw a bird of two colours, and by that bird stood two beasts, which fed that little bird with their heat. And after that came more beasts, and bowing their breasts toward the bird, went their way. Then came there diverse birds that sung sweetly and pleasantly. With that the emperor awaked. In the morning early this Anselm remembered his vision, and wondered much what it might signify. Wherefore he called to him his philosophers, and all the states of the empire, and told them his dream, charging them to tell him the signification thereof on pain of death, and if they told him the true interpretation, he promised them good reward. Then said they, Dear Lord, tell us your dream, and we shall declare to you what it betokens. Then the emperor told them from the beginning to the ending, as is aforesaid. When the philosophers heard this, with glad cheer they answered and said, Sir, the vision that you saw betokeneth good, for the empire shall be clearer than it is. The moon that is more pale on the one side than on the other betokeneth the empress, that hath lost part of her colour, through the conception of a son that she hath conceived. The little bird betokeneth the son that she shall bear, the two beasts that fed this bird betoken the wise and rich men of the empire which shall obey the sun. These other beasts that bowed their breasts to the bird betoken many other nations that shall do him homage. The bird that sang so sweetly to this little bird betokeneth the Romans, who shall rejoice and sing because of his birth. This is the very interpretation of your dream. When the emperor heard this, he was right joyful. Soon after that, the empress travailed in childbirth, and was delivered of a fair son, at whose birth there was great and wonderful joy made. 
When the king of Amploi heard this, he thought to himself thus, Lo, I have warred against the emperor all the days of my life, and now he hath a son who, when he cometh to full age, will revenge the wrong I have done against his father. Therefore it is better that I send to the emperor and beseech him of truce and peace, that the son may have nothing against me when he cometh to manhood. When he had thus said to himself, he wrote to the emperor, beseeching him to have peace. When the emperor saw that the king of Amploi wrote to him more for fear than for love, he wrote again to him, that if he would find good and sufficient sureties to keep the peace, and bind himself all the days of his life to do him service and homage, he would receive him in peace. When the king had read the tenor of the emperor's letter, he called his council praying them to give him counsel how he best might do as touching this matter. Then said they, It is good that ye obey the emperor's will and commandment in all things. For first, in that he desired of you surety for the peace, to this we answer thus, Ye have but one daughter, and the emperor one son. Wherefore let a marriage be made between them, and that may be a perpetual covenant of peace. Also he asketh homage and tribute, which it is good to fulfil. Then the king sent his messengers to the emperor, saying that he would fulfil his desire in all things, if it might please his highness that his son and the king's daughter might be married together. All this well pleased the emperor, yet he sent again, saying, If his daughter were a pure maid from her birth unto that day, he would consent to that marriage. Then was the king right glad, for his daughter was a pure maid. Therefore, when the letters of covenant and compact were sealed, the king furnished a fair ship, wherein he might send his daughter, with many noble knights, ladies, and great riches, unto the emperor, for to have his son in marriage. And when they were sailing in the sea towards Rome, a storm arose so extremely and so horribly that the ship broke against a rock. They were all drowned, save only the young lady, who fixed her hope and heart so greatly on God that she was saved. About three of the clock the tempest ceased, and the lady drove forth over the waves in that broken ship, which was cast up again. But a huge whale followed after, ready to devour both the ship and her. Wherefore this young lady, when night came, smote fire with a stone, wherewith the ship was greatly lightened, and then the whale dared not adventure towards the ship for fear of that light. At the cock crowing, this young lady was so weary of the great tempest and trouble of the sea that she slept. Within a little while after, the fire ceased, and the whale came and devoured the virgin. And when she awaked and found herself swallowed up in the whale's belly, she smote fire, and with a knife wounded the whale in many places. And when the whale felt himself wounded, according to his nature he began to swim to land. There was dwelling at that time in a country nearby a noble earl named Pyrrhus who for his recreation was walking on the seashore. He saw the whale coming towards the land, wherefore he turned home again, and gathered a great many of men and women, and came thither again, and fought with the whale, and wounded him very sore. And as they smote, the maiden that was in his belly cried with a high voice, and said, O gentle friends, have mercy and compassion on me, for I am a king's daughter and a true maid from the hour of my birth unto this day. When the earl heard this, he wondered greatly, and opened the side of the whale, and found the young lady, and took her out. And when she was thus delivered, she told him forthwith whose daughter she was, and how she had lost all her goods in the sea, and how she should have been married unto the emperor's son. And when the earl heard this, he was very glad, and comforted her the more, and kept her with him till she was well refreshed. And in the meantime he sent messengers to the emperor, letting him know how the king's daughter was saved. Then was the emperor right glad of her safety, 
and coming had great compassion on her, saying, Ah, good maiden, for the love of my son thou hast suffered much woe. Nevertheless, if thou be worthy to be his wife, soon shall I prove. And when he had thus said, he caused three vessels to be brought forth. The first was of pure gold, well beset with precious stones without, and within full of dead men's bones, and thereupon was engraven this, Whoso chooseth me shall find what he deserveth. The second vessel was made of fine silver, filled with earth and worms. The superscription was thus, Whoso chooseth me shall find what his nature desireth. The third vessel was made of lead, full within of precious stones, and thereupon was insculped this, Whoso chooseth me shall find that God hath disposed for him. These three vessels the emperor showed the maiden, and said, Lo, here, daughter, these be rich vessels. If thou choose one of these, wherein is profit to thee and to others, then shalt thou have my son. And if thou choose that wherein is no profit to thee nor to any other, in truth thou shalt not marry him. When the maiden heard this, she lifted up her hands to God, and said, Thou, Lord, that knowest all things, grant me grace this hour so to choose, that I may receive the emperor's son. And with that she beheld the first vessel of gold, which was engraven royally, and read the superscription, Whoso chooseth me shall find what he deserveth, saying thus, Though this vessel be full precious and made of pure gold, Nevertheless I know not what is within, therefore, my dear Lord, this vessel will I not choose. And then she beheld the second vessel, that was of pure silver, and read the superscription, Whoso chooseth me shall find what his nature desireth. Thinking thus within herself, If I choose this vessel, what is within I know not, but well I know, there shall I find that which nature desireth, and my nature desireth the lust of the flesh, and therefore this vessel will I not choose. When she had seen these two vessels, and had given an answer about them, she beheld the third vessel of lead, and read the superscription, Whoso chooseth me shall find that God hath disposed. Thinking within herself, This vessel is not very rich, nor outwardly precious, Yet the superscription saith, Whoso chooseth me shall find that God hath disposed, and without doubt God never disposeth any harm, therefore by the leave of God this vessel will I choose. When the emperor heard this, he said, O fair maiden, open thy vessel, for it is full of precious stones, and see if thou hast well chosen or no. And when this young lady had opened it, she found it full of fine gold and precious stones, as the emperor had told her before. Then said the emperor, Daughter, because thou hast well chosen, thou shalt marry my son. And then he appointed the wedding day, and they were married with great solemnity, and with much honour continued to their lives' end. The Land Where Time Stood Still Lafcadio Hearn, the scholar who went from the United States to Japan and taught there, noted that the fishing line of Urashima Taro and some strange jewels he is said to have brought back from the land of no time are to be seen at the seashore temple of Kanagawa. Urashima's absence, according to the Nihongi, Chronicles of Japan, covered nearly 350 years. His departure is stated to have been in 477 AD, and his return and sudden death from senility in 825 AD. This well-known classical story is the subject of much beautiful art. The legend itself has travelled far in terrestrial terms. Catherine M. Briggs reproduces an English version in her excellent British Folk Tales and Legends, London, Routledge, 1977, 
where the hero is King Hurler of the ancient Britons. When he gets home after 200 years, the Saxons have overrun his country and people hardly understand his Celtic speech. But even closer to Urishima's tale, often in matters of detail, is the variant chosen here. It was related by a gypsy in Romania and published by Francis Heinz Groom in 1899. He thought it unique, but since then the theme has been found in many different places. Yet exactly how Urashima of Mizonu became Hurler of England, an unnamed bridegroom of Italy, or even Peterkin of Romania, may never be established. This narration gives a good idea, too, of the directness and vigour of the best gypsy folktelling. There was once a monarch called the Red King. He found that food disappeared from a closet, even though it was locked and guards were placed upon it through the night. The food simply was not there in the morning. He made a proclamation. I will give half my kingdom to anyone who can so guard this closet that the food shall not vanish from it. Now the king had three sons. The eldest thought to himself, Half the kingdom should not go to a stranger who might answer this plea. It would be best for me to keep watch. He went to his father and offered to stay up on guard. The king said, as you may wish, but do not be frightened by anything you may see. The prince went to the closet and lay down to stay beside it for the night. But as soon as he put his head on the pillow, he fell asleep and stayed asleep until dawn, for a warm, sleepy breeze arose and lulled him into a deep slumber. While he was asleep, his small sister, only a tiny child, got up and turned a somersault. Instantly her nails became like an axe and her teeth like a shovel. She opened the closet and devoured everything in it. Then she reverted to the appearance of an ordinary small child and returned to her cradle. For she was in fact both a witch and a babe unweaned. The prince got up in the morning and told his father that he had seen nothing. The king went to the closet and found it completely bare. Everything was gone. He said to his son, It would take a better man than you to solve this. Even he might be able to do nothing. Then the middle son said to the king, Father, I shall keep watch tonight. The king agreed, warning him to be brave. The second son lay down beside the closet in the palace. At ten o'clock the warm breeze came and cast him into a deep sleep. The tiny princess, who was a witch, arose from her cradle and unwrapped herself from her swaddling clothes. She turned a somersault and her nails and teeth were transformed as before. Again she went to the closet and opened it and ate up all the food which it contained. And as before she rotated herself and went back to her usual place in the cradle. When day broke, the young prince went to his father to confess that he had seen and heard nothing, and the king told him that it would take a better man than he to unravel the mystery. It was now the turn of the youngest prince, and he asked, and was given, permission by the king to watch the closet that night. This young man, however, did not at once lay himself down to rest like his brothers. He took four needles and stuck them in four places. When he began to feel tired, he pricked himself with a needle, and so he stayed awake until ten o'clock. When the tiny witch rose from her cradle, her brother saw her. He watched while she turned a somersault, and as her nails and teeth became transformed, and as she devoured the food, and when she returned to her cradle. The prince was terrified. He trembled with fear, and it seemed to him, as he lay quietly there, that ten years passed before the dawn. When it was light, his father sought him out and said, Did you see anything? What did I see? What did I not see? answered the youth, and he would say no more about his terrible experience. 
He asked the king to give him some money and a horse and to let him travel, for he had decided to go away and get married. His father gave him two sacks of money and a horse, and he went to the outskirts of the city and dug a hole. He left the coins buried there in a stone box and put a stone cross on top to mark the place. Then he set off on his travels. He journeyed for eight years, and then he came to the place of the queen of all the birds that fly. She asked him, Where are you going? He said, I am going yonder, where there is neither death nor old age, to get married. The queen said to him, There is neither death nor old age here. The prince asked her how that was. The queen said, Death and old age will not come to take me away until I have broken the last twig of this huge forest. But the prince realized that that time would in fact come one day, and so he started off again on his way. After another eight years, he arrived at a palace of copper. Out of it came a maiden who took him in her arms and kissed him. She said, I have waited a very long time for you. She took the prince and the horse in her charge, and he spent the night there. In the morning he placed the saddle on his horse. Then the maiden began to weep and asked, Where are you going? I am going further, to where there is neither death nor old age. She told him that there was neither of those things where they now were, and the prince asked her how that could be. Death will not come here until these mountains are leveled and these forests have disappeared. That is not good enough for me, he said, and he went on his way. Now of all things, his horse said to him, Master, whip me four times and yourself twice, for you have come to the plain of regret, and regret can seize you and throw you down, horse and all. So spur your horse and escape, and do not linger here. He did as he was told, and crossed the plain of regret, and then came to a hut. A lad came out and asked, Where are you going and what do you want? The prince told him of his quest. The lad said, There is neither death nor old age here, for I am the wind. At last the prince thought he could rest. He stayed there for a hundred years, and he did not age at all. He used to go hunting, and always found so much game that he could hardly carry it home. The wind had said to him, Go, by all means, into the mountains of gold and the mountains of silver, but do not go into the mountain of regret or to the valley of grief. But one day the prince did go to the mountain of regret and into the valley of grief, and that was how grief cast him down until his eyes were full of tears. He remembered his home and went to the wind in sadness, saying, I am going home to my father, for I cannot stay here any longer. The wind told him, Do not go, for your father is dead, and you have no brothers either. A million years have come and gone since the times you recall at the palace. Even the place where the building stood is not remembered. Melons have been planted on it, I know, for I passed that way no more than an hour ago. But the prince took no notice of the wind and started on his way back to his home. As he arrived at the palace of copper, he saw that the mountains were flat and that the maiden had cut the last stick of the forest and that she had died. He buried her and continued his journey. Presently he came to the queen of all the birds that fly. When she saw him, she said, You are still young. Then she broke through the very last branch in her forest, and she fell and died. At long last the prince came to the place where his father's palace had stood, and looked around him. It was practically a wilderness. All he could see as he exclaimed, God, thou art wonderful, was the well of his father. He went towards it, and suddenly his sister, the witch, rushed at him, crying, I have waited long for you, dog. 
She was trying to devour him when he made the sign of the cross at her, and she perished. As he was walking away from the place, he came across an old man with a beard down to his belt. He said, Father, where is the palace of the Red King? I am his son. What is that you say, my child? asked the Ancient One. You say that you are his son? My grandfather told me about the Red King. But his palace is gone, his very city has vanished timeless ages ago, and you say that you are his son? It is not twenty years, old man, said the prince, that I left my father's presence. Follow me if you do not believe me. In fact, it was a million years that had passed. The prince found the cross of stone, now almost completely covered with earth. He struggled for two days to get to the stone box with the money in it. When he lifted the box and opened it, death sat in one of the corners, and old age in another. Old age said, Seize him, death. Death said, Get him yourself. Old age took him in front, and death from behind and so he died. The old man took him and gave him a decent burial, and then took for himself the money and the horse. The man turned into a mule. This story, popular in Spain and known in Spanish-speaking countries throughout the world, has in fact a far greater point in the oriental lands of its origin, where the transforming element is a magician. There is no record of representatives of the Catholic Church having the alleged power to change a man into a mule, whether as a punishment or otherwise. This, of course, is the kind of internal evidence which folklorists look for in plotting the derivations of a tale. And yet, in anti-clerical periods, the narrative has been used to imply that illiberal clergy may keep peasants in such ignorance that they are considered near magicians. In the Far East, people who feel that human reincarnation into animal form is absurd have used the tale to mock transmigrationists. In other areas, townspeople have been regaled with it to pander to an appetite for foolish peasant jokes. In both the literary and oral forms, it lends itself well to emphasis of whichever of these elements it is desired to point up, and it is also widely regarded as a trickster joke. This multiple potential may account for its durability and popularity. But it also means that those who try to categorise tales into humour, peasant, reincarnation, trickster, anti-clerical and so on tend to leave it alone when advancing theories that all stories may be slotted into neat systems. Once there was a student who, being extremely poor, began to think of some way of adding to his very small store of silver coins. He gathered together his student friends, and they talked about it all night, each of them being in the same position. Soon, Juan Rivas, for that was his name, thought of a plan. Friends, said he, you look upon one tonight, who tomorrow shall be the son of one of the first grandees of Spain. When the laughter had died down, he looked very wise, but refused to tell them any more. I assure you that if you bear with me for a day, by this time tomorrow night I shall be back with a story which will give us all a merry time together. Putting his plan into action, Juan Rivas, with his friend Carlos, went along the road next morning, looking for a man with a string of mules. Sure enough, after a while he came upon such a man, sitting on the first mule, and leading his string towards the next town. Juan Rivas let the five mules pass, then as the last one came by him he seized it, and handed it over to Carlos, who was hidden behind the hedge. Take this mule and sell it in the market, he whispered. Give me the money later when we all meet at the cafe. 
So saying, he placed the mule's saddle-cloth over his back, and followed the other mules as if he in fact was one of them. The day was very warm, and the muleteer was half asleep, sitting cross-legged on the biggest animal. Nothing worried him for about half an hour, when he became aware that all the mules had come to a halt. This was the work of Juan Rivas, who was getting to the second stage of his plan. Hola, shouted the muleteer. Get going, you stupid beasts, I haven't got all day to waste. And he administered hefty kicks to the sides of the animal he was sitting upon. Still the creatures could not start, as Juan Rivas was holding onto the reins of the fourth mule, so the muleteer got off his animal and saw a human being saddled and bridled at the back. What in the world are you doing there, young man? he bellowed with many a curse, as muleteers, owing to the nature of their calling, are extremely bad-tempered. It is no freak, you see, my friend, said Juan Rivas sadly, but reality, I am no longer your fifth mule, whom you have beaten so unmercifully in the past, but have now returned to my own shape. But, but, what do you mean? Explain the matter as soon as you may, said the puzzled muleteer, scratching his head. Well, my friend, I offended Holy Mother Church many times, I am sorry to say, for which misdeeds I was turned into a mule for several years. That time I have faithfully served, and my period of imprisonment being over, I am now, by the dispensation of providence, back to normal, as you might say, on this very day. But, but where is my mule, which cost me one hundred pieces of silver not many years ago? asked the man. It may not have been many years to you, my friend, but it has been an eternity to me, cried Juan Rivas. Do understand me, please. I was that mule. The mule was me. Now I am back in human form, able to speak in a human voice. Would that I could have told you how I felt about it over the years when you abused me and beat me so much. But that was my punishment, and I have served you faithfully. Now you speak to all that remains of your mule. Do you understand me? Scarcely, mumbled the rustic. But I am not usually faced with this sort of thing. It appears to me now that you must have been that animal. I always thought there was something funny about that mule. Well, be quick about it, said the student, and get this saddle and saddle cloth off me, and take your uncomfortable bridle too. I've had enough of it, and I'm bruised from neck to ankle as well. However, all that is now over, and you will always be able to say that the son of one of the first grandees of Spain served you as a beast of burden, and is now restored to wealth and rank. Are you a man of power and money, then? gasped the man. Oh, sir, I beg you, forgive me for all I did to you when you were a mule. I hope you will not have me in prison for the kicks I aimed at your excellency. I am a ruined man. No, no, dear fellow, said Juan Rivas kindly. You are not to know that I was not a mule. Heavens, that is not your fault at all. I am a charitable man. I did wrong and was punished. It will not in any way help me in my case with heaven if now I were to take vengeance on you. Think nothing of this and forget it. Then I am forgiven. Oh, your excellency will not hold it against me. Oh, God bless you, noble sir. It will be a great consolation to me that none of my highly born friends will know what has been happening to me for so many wretched years, said the student piously and I would indeed esteem it a favour if you do not divulge this to a living soul. Give me your word as an honest man upon it. I promise, Your Honour, that torture would not drag the true state of affairs from me, cried the poor bewildered fellow. Oh, good-bye, dear exalted sir, and may you never again incur the dissatisfaction of Holy Mother Church. Thus they parted, the muleteer pondering over the strange mysteries of life, and the great secret with which he had been entrusted by one of the family of a grandee of Spain, and Juan Rivas to his rendezvous with his friend Carlos, who, he hoped, had got a good price for the mule. The pleasure of a grand feast with those young people to whom he had promised hospitality and entertainment the night before made Juan Rivas whistle joyfully as he walked back into the town. 
as it fell out, they enjoyed good food and wine, telling and retelling the story to all and sundry till dawn broke. Some weeks later there was a cattle market in the town, and the muleteer who had lost his fifth mule was looking for a new animal. The auctioneer, who knew him, asked what had happened to the other one. I parted with it for personal and private reasons, was all he could get out of the muleteer, and I cannot discuss those reasons with you. Oh, well, why you did it is your own business, of course, said the auctioneer. But if I were you, I would just buy it back, for it stands over there, you will recognize it at once. I did, for have you not been coming in every Friday on it for more years than I care to mention? By the saints, murmured the muleteer to himself, so it is. Walking over to the animal, he said to it, Well, your excellency, I can't imagine what you must have been doing to incur the wrath of the church so soon again, but terrible indeed, as we know, are the ways of providence. Have no fear, I will buy you and this time I promise to treat you as one born to your station. The Fox and the Hedgehog This fable has the distinction of being the very earliest one attributed to Aesop which is on record. It is found in the philosopher Aristotle's rhetoric. It refers there to people embezzling from the state. Quite detailed and conflicting biographies of Aesop exist, but there is no assurance that any of the material in them is at all accurate. He is said to have been black, which is what his name means, and to have been born in Greece or Asia about 620 BC. Two thousand years or so later, his fables were published by Caxton in England. They had been printed around the same time in Greek and Latin. The Greeks, Hindus and Egyptians have all been credited with the invention of the fable, and very many of those ascribed to Aesop are from other sources. Some people think that the first ever was the parable of Jotham in the Bible, Judges chapter 9 verses 7 to 15, and the supposedly Aesopian fable of the lion and the mouse is found in an ancient Egyptian papyrus. Aesop was certainly famous enough for Aristophanes to feature his teachings as being part of oral learning, and Socrates himself is said to have versified some of the stories. Incidents from the supposed life of the fabulist have been grafted upon a wide variety of people. They adhere to the name of the Dominican monk Etienne of Bourbon, who presented them for preachers in the 14th century. They are in the Arab Book of Sindabad, in the Old English tale of Berin, they are credited to Till Eulenspiegel, the German rascal, and they are even found in China as national traditions. A fox, while crossing a river, was driven by the stream into a narrow creek, and lay there for a long time trapped. He was covered with a multitude of horseflies which had fastened themselves upon him. It so happened that a hedgehog, wandering in the area, saw the unhappy condition of the fox, and called out to him, Would you like me to drive away those flies which are tormenting you so much? But the fox begged the hedgehog to do nothing of the sort. The hedgehog was surprised. Why not? it asked. Because, replied the fox, the flies which are sticking on to me now are already full, and are not drawing very much more blood. If you were to remove them, a swarm of fresh and hungry ones would descend, and they would not leave a drop of blood in my body.